God. Amen. You should have a study guide there uh, in your bulletin. That was a nice change. Pastor Jonathan didn't have to put them on every chair. And uh, if you did not receive a study guide that goes with the message today, just raise your hand and an usher will. Yes, we've got several here. We need lots of ushers. Up here in the front, keep your hand raised. Amen. Up here in the front, the front, the front, over here. As fast as you can. Don't run, but run. <laughs> I'm speaking on the subject of God's working power in you. God's working power in you. The Bible tells us that it is God who works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. I want God's good pleasure in my life, and I know where it begins. It begins with salvation. Being born again, marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. Born again, there's really been a change in me. Born again, just like Jesus said. Born again, and all because of Calvary. I'm glad, so glad that I've been born again. Thank God, thank God, thank God. I mentioned Karen earlier. Phil, it's good to see you back in church. He went through a real health crisis, and we rejoice that you're here today, too. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God's working power in you is demonstrated in his ability to convert you, to choose you, to transform you, to confirm you, to call you, to change you, to conform you to his image, and to renew you by his knowledge. We have a uh, multiple list of questions that we put down on paper. It's a test that uh, for premarital counseling and um, Sometimes a very young couple will come in, and one of the questions on the premarital counseling test is, what would you change about this person? And um, some of you are thinking about that right now, what would I change about this person? And occasionally it'll be a young gal, she'll come in there and she'll, her eyes are just, oh, I wouldn't change anything about him. To which I say, go away and come back when you know something. <laughs> what would you change about him? Now, if they make a long list, might want to reconsider who you're marrying, you know. But um, uh, nonetheless, there's always something that you wanted to change. When my wife and I first got married, the uh, problem was with the toothpaste. Brand new tube. And this woman would squeeze it in the middle. I, I know that I had no bad habits that bothered her, but that one bothered me a little bit. Does the toilet paper roll go on the top or underneath? I don't know the answer to these things. And then in marital counseling years later when they come in. There's a whole list of things. I'd like to change that about him. I'd like to change that about her. And I unfortunately have to deliver the bad news. And the bad news is you aren't going to change him. You aren't going to change him. There are relatively few things in the human condition that truly cause us to desire to change and to really change. One of those things might be a shock. One time I got on the scale and I saw a number that I had never seen before. And on that day I decided that that would be the end of that and I lost, let's see, did I lose 45 pounds? I really did. I was a big boy back then. Just the shock of seeing that number I said, well, if I don't stop this, <laughs> trouble lies ahead. So I cut back from two packs of cookies a day to one. 
And then there's something else that tends to cause change in the human person, the human condition, and that is tragedy. And I look around the room and I see numerous people who have experienced great tragedies. And it grips our heart, it changes us. In a dynamic way, it changes us. Either a deeper, greater reliance upon the Lord or perhaps a bitterness that comes from such events. But as a pastor of this church, I'm here today to tell you there is one and only one that can change you, and it's not you. Jesus can make the change, the transformation in your life, the metamorphosis over and over again. Many of these words start with the word meta in the Greek, change. Hallelujah. And Jesus can change your life. The first part of this is to be converted knowing that we are chosen. Matthew 18 and 3, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And I'm telling you that when he says things like, you cannot or you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven, he has my full attention. Except you be converted. And the word in the Greek in this particular verse means to turn or to turn around. I have been walking in my sins, in my iniquities, in my trespasses, and I have received Christ. I am converted. Now I turn the other way and walk in a new direction. How many of you are thankful for being converted? Born again just like Jesus said. You want true change in your life? You want the darkness to flee and the light to come into your soul? Be converted. For when you are converted, you become as a little child and you will enter the kingdom of heaven. Later on in Luke chapter 22, verses 31 and 32, the Lord says to Simon Peter, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. This is one among many verses that tell us of the intention of Satan. It is Satan's desire to take you, even if you are a disciple of Jesus Christ and walking with him, it is Satan's desire to sift you as wheat. I don't know if you remember Mama's old flour sifter, but that's what Satan wants to do to your soul and your mind. He wants to do that to you. Satan hath desired to have thee that he may sift you as wheat, but Jesus said, I have prayed for thee. How many of you are thankful Jesus prays for us? That thy faith fail not. Hallelujah. That thy faith fail not. And when, not if, when thou art converted, strengthen thy brother. The first verse in Matthew talked about the definition of to turn or to turn around. This is a little bit different in the Greek in that it is to turn again. When you are converted, suggest that he has made this great error. What did he do? He denied the Lord. But when he is converted, he turns again and he is to strengthen his brethren. I marvel at the life of Peter who amazingly denying the Lord three times, a coward, betrays the Lord is really almost as much as Judas did in that he denied him. And yet, 50 days later, preaches a sermon about Jesus, this Jesus whom you crucified, God hath made him Lord in Christ, and 3,000 men are saved. It's amazing. That's a change. And he did exactly what the Lord did. He fed the sheep, and he... He strengthened his brethren. I want to thank God today in the subject of conversion. And I know this scares us semi-Armenians, us um, uh, Assembly of God, Pentecostals. This scares us a little bit, but it shouldn't because it's throughout the pages of Scripture. We are both chosen and predestined. This does not eliminate free will, but I'm telling you, it's good to be chosen. My mom and dad got me from birth. They were stuck with what they got. 
Those of you that have been adopted, you were chosen. It's a special thing. It's a special place. We're adopted to be sons and daughters of God. And so I wanted to share with you these verses about being chosen. And this word chosen throughout these passages means to pick out or to select, choosing with the ideas of his kindness, his favor, and his love toward you. It was the pleasure of God to choose you. Hallelujah. John 15, 16, you have not chosen me, Jesus said, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. Whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he may give it you. How many of you believe the words of Jesus? Then you're chosen. John 15, 19, same chapter. If you were of the world, the world would love his own, but because you are not of the world, thank God we're not of this world. But I have chosen you, help me, out of the world. Thank God, thank God. Therefore, the world hates you. Jesus has let us know clearly that the world hated, hates Jesus, and they do. And so they're going to hate you. Still yet, hated by the world is not a bad thing. And being chosen of God, selected, picked out, that's a good thing. Thank God that he did choose us to bear fruit and to pray for whatever we ask in the Father in Jesus' name. He gives it to you. Aren't you thankful that we can pray in the name of Jesus, the same one who chose us? Thank God. Chosen out of the world, and the world hates us. Ephesians 1, 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has what? Blessed us. How many of you are blessed today? I sure do. Blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Man, can you wrap your head around that one? I, I think you could spend a whole day, a lifetime maybe, thinking about that. That we have this tremendous blessing, spiritual blessings, and they are in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Sometimes Christians get accused of having their heads in the clouds. Why not? We're in heavenly places with Christ Jesus simply because we left this old world and we left sin and we chose Christ, he chose us. Thank God that we have the benefits and blessings of spiritual blessings in heavenly places when in Christ. According as he has chosen us in him when before the foundation of the world. This plan of salvation, this plan of redemption is not plan B. It is plan A, A, A. It is the only plan. And it was a plan made before there was an Adam and before there was an Eve, before there was a garden. It was a plan before the foundation of the world. God knew exactly what man would do. God knew exactly what he was doing when he created man with that free choice to choose between good and evil. And man, God offered man a way, a path, a plan of redemption. Chosen us, plural, church chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having what? Predestined us, again, plural, church, chosen us, predestined us, under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ himself to the good pleasure of his will. It was his good pleasure to choose you. From time to time, I'll talk with somebody that doesn't like themselves. They don't like themselves. When you think about the love of God for you, the design of God when he created you, the plan of God, I'm glad we don't all look like me. That'd be a mess. We all look different. We don't even sound like each other. You know, often you'll call me on the phone and I'll call you by name because I can recognize your voices. You can't disguise it. Of course, caller ID helps, but... Uh, God knew us, church. He knew the church before the foundation of the world. Our God is omniscient. 
And he brought adoption to us as children by Jesus Christ to himself. Thank God. Second Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through the sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Thank God for salvation. Thank God for the sanctification of the Spirit, a changing force in our lives. Mm. Thank God for belief of the truth. Hear me, church. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Don't have anger, have pity on a lost and dying world that does not know the truth. How many times have you heard Pastor Jonathan or myself say it? Because the Bible says it and you can quote it as well. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Thank God for belief in the truth, and Jesus is the truth. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. Thank God, thank God. So here's this man, the Apostle Paul, formerly known as Saul of Tarsus. And he thinks that he is doing the will of God and that he is persecuting these people of the way. These Christians, followers of Christ, he is doing all the damage, all of the harm that he can possibly do. He is the most responsible party for the death of Stephen the martyr, thinking all the while that he is doing the will of God, a Pharisee, knowledgeable in the law, trying to suppress, trying to subdue, trying to persecute this new thing called, not yet called actually, Christianity. The Bible tells us that Saul of Tarsus, the persecutor of the church, journeyed. He came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. Aren't you thankful for the day that the light from heaven shined upon your life? Brought a change, a dramatic change, a dynamic change, an instant change. This will come up many times probably in this sermon today, but if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. This is God's working power in you, for only God can take an old sinner and make him new, transform his life in such a fashion as this. The light shined upon Saul of Tarsus, the persecutor of the church. Where did the light come from? The light came from heaven. Hey, the light didn't come from the pulpit. The light didn't come from my mouth. The light comes from heaven. The voice comes from heaven. And it is the Lord Jesus Christ who can take an old sinner bound in iniquity and touch his heart and make that hard heart tender. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Alas, and did my Savior bleed and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Well, that sure contradicts the modern preaching, doesn't it? The I am somebody preaching? No, we're just an old wretch and a worm. None righteous, no, not one. Until the day that the light shined down from heaven above. Wow. And all of a sudden, things change. Saul fell to the earth, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, how many of you know Jesus knows your name? Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou? Lord. And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembled 
Hey, if you're a sinner today, trembling is appropriate. If you're a believer today, trembling is appropriate. Where is the fear of God? The Bible says that he was trembling. Why not? He'd been knocked off his donkey. He was blind, and he heard a voice from heaven speaking. I think the Lord will go to extraordinary means to get your attention. It was an old-fashioned meeting in an old-fashioned place where some old-fashioned people had some old-fashioned grace. As an old-fashioned sinner, I began to pray, and God heard me and saved me in the old-fashioned way. And I'm telling you the truth, and the way to God has never changed. It's Jesus. Come, ye sinners lost and hopeless. Jesus' blood can set you free, for he saved the worst among you when he saved a wretch like me. And I know, I surely know, Jesus' blood can make the vilest sin. Come on, somebody thank God. Come on, really, thank God, thank God. I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. And his response is this, Lord, what will you have me to do? Arise, go to the city, and it shall be told thee what they must do. And as the Lord sends Ananias to talk to Saul of Tarsus, he tells Ananias, I'm going to tell him what his purpose is. I'm going to tell this Saul of Tarsus what his new name is going to be. I'm going to tell this Saul of Tarsus that I have called him, I have chosen him to be my apostle to the world. Wow. Thank God that we are converted and we are chosen. Praise the Lord. Number two, we are transformed. Now, I mentioned to you that many of these words that we're using today to describe God's working power in you begin with the word meta, change. Transformed is one of those words. Metamorpho, or, you know, metamorphosis, change, metamorpho. And in each one of these words where it begins with meta, this morph comes in as a central part of that word, morph. It is a change. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Yes, God, you are merciful. What's our part? Our part is that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy. How many of you know you're the temple of the Holy Ghost? Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. The Bible teaches us that this world is passing away. This world is passing away. I hear them talk about the billions and trillions of years old that this earth is. Well, I hate to tell you, it's not that old. And I hate to tell you, someday this old earth will burn with fire. It will be destroyed by God. And what will he put in its place? A new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. That's a transformation there. <laughs> And that's what he does in the individual life as well, that we are not conformed to this world. This world's passing away. But you are what? Come on, say it with me. You are transformed. Trans being the change, form. It's a new species of being that hasn't existed before. We were dead in trespasses and sins, but now we're alive in Christ. Dead to sin, dead to the world, but we're alive in Christ. Transformed by the renewing of your mind. Thank God he got a hold of my mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I do marvel at modern teaching that will accept the grace of God, but won't accept the transformation. All in the name of tolerance. Tolerance. There's another word for it, I think. Compromise. Compromise. Whew. 
Thank God after salvation, I'm not the same man I was. Hmm. Transformed. A renewed mind. Proving the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's not the old man, that's a new man. And he's been transformed. I've been changed. I've been newborn again. All my life has been rearranged. What a difference he made. Hallelujah, what a difference he made. Transformed. Not conformed. Transformed. I'm kind of marvel at how the world walks in lockstep with each other. I want us to be different. In Christ. Separate from the world. Separate from sin. Separate from all the ills and the evils of the world. Scaling the utmost height. Pressing on toward the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Ever looking up for our redemption draws nigh. Turn to your neighbor and tell him you are not of this world. Hallelujah. Transformed. God's working power in you. You're converted. You're chosen. You're transformed. And I love this. You are confirmed. You're confirmed. I grew up with words like uh, saved and born again. And my friend around the corner, Randy, he grew up with the word confirmed. He didn't know what saved and born again meant, and I didn't know what confirmed meant. But I do know this now. Saved and born again is what Jesus does to you. And confirmed in the way he described it to me is what the church did to you. I'd rather have the Lord working in me than, the you know. Notice there's a testimony. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed where? You know, I just, I just want to touch my heart. Thank you, Lord. This testimony of Jesus didn't just find its way here. This testimony of Jesus found its way here. I, I illustrate it often because I just love to say it. I never went up to my wife and said, I love you with all my mind. I don't think it would work. She would think, that's not much of a mind. <laughs> I love you with my heart. The testimony of Jesus Christ is confirmed where? In you. Any of you going to turn back? No turning back. No turning back. This testimony of Jesus has been confirmed in you. You that are saved. So that you become, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wouldn't it just be great today to go home right now? Anybody anxious for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ? Anticipating Jesus is coming again. What will he do? Who shall also confirm you to the end? that you may be blameless, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. What does the word confirm mean? It means simply to make firm, to establish, to secure, and to stabilize. Thank God we can be secure in him. I grew up in a church that uh, preached eternal insecurity. And uh, then, of course, many of you grew up in a church that preaches eternal security and that type of thing. I just have a question on either side of that ledger. Are you in Christ? Are you in Christ Jesus? See, I'm a simple man, a simple mind. I, I need to have it simple for me. Jesus is the door. One side of that door is outside, and one side of that door is inside. 
So all of you that are sitting right here, are you inside or outside? All right, come on now, help me now. Are you inside or outside? Well, duh. <laughs> and when this message is over, and before every head is bowed and every eye is closed, some of you already be outside. I don't know how that goes. How did you get inside? You opened the door and you crossed a threshold. And when you go outside this morning, if the Lord doesn't come during this message, you'll cross through that same door and over that same threshold and you'll be outside. And so I don't need to ask you about your eternal security or eternal insecurity. I just have to ask you, are you inside or are you outside? For if any man be in Christ, hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm firm in him, I'm established in him, I'm secure in him, I'm stable, whether you believe it or not, I'm stable in him. My Bible tells me that nothing will pluck me out of the Father's hand and nothing will pluck me out of Jesus' hand. Thank God, thank God. Could I choose to fall away? I could, but I'm not going to. The testimony of Christ has been confirmed in me and in you. Somebody thank God today. God, give us the grace to stand. To live for you in an evil day. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back. No turning back. How many of you going all the way to glory with Jesus? You see, the testimony of Jesus has been confirmed in you. I think it even gets better. Called. Called. 1 Corinthians 1, 9. Say it with me. God is faithful. Is God a failure? No, God is faithful. You need never question him. Regardless of the circumstances of your life or mine, God is faithful. By whom you were called. In this particular instance, the word calls means divinely called to partake of the blessings of redemption. Divinely called. I love it when mama called for dinner. I'd always show up. Uh, away at Oral Roberts University, away at Central Bible College, and get a call from mom. You know, it's, it's not like today, you know, where you get to FaceTime and all that good stuff, Zoom, whatever. And it was an infrequent call, and when you got the call, that was, that was glorious. And then, then we went from Bible college straight out to Leota, Kansas, 365 miles like a dart that way. And uh, get a call, get a call. Yes, we had telephones in Leota. <laughs> Didn't have them long before we got there, but we got them. But to consider that... He knows my name. He knows my every thought. He has called you by name, and you are His. I'm my beloved, and He is mine. His banner over me is love. You were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Then comes another kind of calling in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. <laughs> this is a modern version. His own special people. Chris said earlier, uh, the right word in the King James, peculiar people. I just want to, let me have your eyes. 
You're special. <laughs> You're so special. You're a peculiar people that you may show forth the praises of him who has what? Called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And here that word call in the Greek means to summon. You have been summoned out of this old world, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. We have this term in the Greek ecclesia that, recalls, that calls the church called out ones. And the same root word of that exists here when we are called. We are summoned by him to be what he has called us to be. We are called out of darkness and into light. Once we were not a people, but now we're the people of God. Once we had not obtained mercy, but now we have obtained mercy. Number five, change. Change. Jesus, the Holy Spirit of God, God our Father, he can change you. Again, metamorphosis exists here, a meta, a change. Now the Lord is that spirit. Uh, I don't know who it was that asked me. I think, I think you did. Uh, somebody asked me, uh, the grandson asked, what does God look like? And she said, ask Pastor Dan when, he, when you get here. And we have all these anthropomorphisms of God, you know, is the right hand of God, his wings, you know, does God have wings, and, you know, all this type of thing, his beard, you know. Uh, it's, it's really quite a mystery, to be honest with you, but there's one thing that I know above all other things. God is a spirit. God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I know he sits on the throne, and I know that Jesus sits at his right hand. Every apostle who writes in the Bible, practically all of them confirm that truth. But here Paul writes to the Corinthians, the Lord is that spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, you know, this is pretty good stuff here. I lost, left behind the bondage. And I was freed by the power of the blood, by the glory of this gospel, this testimony of Jesus made me free. The truth made me free. And if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And now, what do I have? I have liberty. So far you've been good and friendly. I hope I don't lose you. I am not a subject of the United States of America. I am a citizen of the United States of America. I am not a slave. I'm a free man. And government wants to do nothing except exercise control over my life. But I've given my life to Jesus, and he, and he alone, has control of my life. He and he alone will determine how long my feet stand on planet Earth. He and he alone will determine my destiny. He and he alone is the potter. I am nothing but the clay. I and you who are believers belong to him. And though in prison, though in prison, we are still free. Held captive, we are still free. Hallelujah. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Somebody wave at me if you're awake. <laughs> Glory to God. 
There's liberty. I am free from the past. I am free from sin. I am free from the control of the devil and all of his minions. I am free. I am free. I am free. I am free from guilt. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Free indeed. Mm. Thank you, Lord. There's liberty, and we all with open face beholding as in a glass, in a mirror, we behold the glory of the Lord. Help me. Are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And this time, the word in the Greek means to fashion anew, changed, to fashion anew. Strange things have happened to me in my 60s, and I'm only 61. My left knee is driving me nuts. I do pretty good till I'm on the stairs. And then my old left knee says, you're getting older. I would ask for a show of hands of how many of you have new parts, but we're beholding him in a glass, in a mirror. We behold the glory of the Lord, and we are changed. We are, hear me, fashioned anew into the same image. From glory to glory, who does it? Even as by the Spirit of the Lord. I don't even think an individual can change themselves. I think only God can change you. Of course, there was a lady one time that she had all this plastic surgery done. She had everything that could be done was done to her from head to toe. She had plastic surgery. She had just finished the pain and the recovery of the last surgery, and she walked out of the doctor's office into the street and got hit by a car, ruined everything that had been done to her. She's in the emergency room crying out to God, 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 why? Why would you let this happen to me after all I've been through? Why me? Why me? Why me? God answered, honey, I couldn't recognize you. <laughs> Sorry. Some preacher told me that. We aren't changed into a similar likeness to ourselves. We're changed into the image of God. How did it happen? From glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord. I told you at the beginning of this message that people only change because of tragedy. Something that shocks them into wanting change. No. The reality is people change at the altar. People change by the power of the blood. People change in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. People change when Christ comes in. We are changed from glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord, and we are at liberty. God's working power in you causes us to be changed. Sharon, are you ready for this one? We are, oh, it's missing on the slide. That's not good. Number six, look in your notes. We're conformed. I happen to know that Sharon and I both love Philippians 3. We're conformed. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable, conformable. There's that form is a root word again, formed, conformable unto his death. It means to make like him or to morph, M-O-R-P-H-E, to morph. I'm being conformed. In 2 Corinthians 3, I was changed into his image, but here I'm being conformed to his... Come on, look at it. I'm conformed 
to his death. Hey, unless Jesus comes here, we're all going to die. By what means, when, I don't know. But we're all going to die. If I could impart a message to us today, I'd want you to know, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, there is no fear of death. No fear of death. None. But here on one hand, we're being changed from glory to glory into the image of the Lord. And on another hand, we're being conformable unto his death. How many countless thousands and hundreds of thousands have died for his namesake? Oh, I want to know him, the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformable to his death, and being conformed to him is a wonderful thing. And finally today, renewed. Colossians 3, 9, and 10, lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off, put off the old man with his deeds. Thank God, thank God we put off the old man. What did we do then? We put on the new man. That new man is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. And this word renewed means to make new again. So I'm converted, I turned. I'm converted, I turned again. I'm chosen, I was picked out, I was selected. Oh, I was transformed, had a metamorphosis, a total change of who I was. I'm confirmed, established, secure, stable. I'm called, divinely partaking of the blessings of redemption. I'm summoned, not my own, I'm his. I'm changed, I've been fashioned anew. I'm conformed unto his death, made like him to, to morph. And I'm renewed. I've been made new again. Hallelujah. There's only one way this happens. It's through salvation in Christ Jesus. Stand with me, please.